This morning, it is our honor. It is a privilege of ours to have David and Donna Delp with us today in the house of the Lord. They serve in our district office and have served so faithfully for so many years. They are people of godly reputation. They are carriers of his presence. And it's my honor today, Dave, to have you come and share the word of the Lord with us today. Bless the Lord. He is indeed good, and he's proven that to us many, many times. Would somebody say amen to that? Hey, I tell you what, we've got, uh, we've got our annual conference that starts tomorrow morning in Fort Wayne, and uh, Pastor Jerry said, you know, you, you feel okay, you know, doing this today and moving, I'm, I feel great ready to go. We're going to head up there after that. We're believing God for a great time in his presence, and we're believing God for a great time in his presence this morning right here. I appreciate this church. We appreciate this church. We appreciate your pastors, Pastor Jerry and Paula, and uh, the, the entire team, the board, all the people that we know from this church and the stability that you've lent to the fellowship through the years. The blessing that you've been, I'm reminded of some of the epistles that Paul wrote. Um, I, think, uh, I'm, I think I might be thinking of the one to the Thessalonians, but uh, where he, he uh, encourages them that they have been an encouraging bunch to the rest of the body of Christ. And that's a huge admonition, a huge encouragement for us to receive. And so I bring that same encouragement to you this morning that you are an encouragement to the, to the greater body of Christ. So I thank the Lord for that. I was, I, we, we, we were here for a pastor appreciation day, maybe a couple of years ago. I don't know exactly how long it was, and that was a, that was a great day. That was the last time, I think, that we were in the house here with you, and we've been excited to be here again today. I, I have a word from the Lord on my heart to share with you. And it's one of those things where my, my ministry and it, when I, when I say this word, you may not think of it in the same way that I think of this word, but it's prophetic in that I'm very sensitive to what God's saying to me. I try to be very sensitive to what he's saying to me in the moment. And as a result, the last decade of, of ministry, um, I very rarely have preached. Sometimes I say the same things. In, in different churches, but uh, very, very rarely have I preached the same message over the last decade from one church to the next. And so when there's two services, I'm always, if I'm not careful, I can let it throw me because sometimes the second service isn't exactly like the first one, and I need to be okay with that. And I think we're going to start in the same place and have the same scripture, but I am always excited to listen to the voice of God in the here and now, the right now, that there is a group of people assembled here, and God is very gifted. <laughs> in fact, he owns all gifts. And so God is able to communicate in such a way that every ear that is contacting with the revelation of him through his word, it's, it's relevant and it connects. And I've found that if you, if you change that even just a little bit as far as those that are assembled together, sometimes it changes the expression of the revelation of God. So I say all that to set myself at ease to you. You're good with it either way. It doesn't matter. But I've set myself at ease. And I, I'm going to preach uh, about the glory of God this morning. And I approach it with fear and trembling because the glory of God is something that I've always struggled to understand the glory of God. We can pull a, dic a dictionary definition of the word glory, and we can look at a definition as it relates to an attribute, to the character, to the nature of God, but I never really understood the glory, the glory of God, and even the word. I always have struggled to give definition to the word glory as it relates to God. I would think back to 
to my junior high and high school days, and if you had a kid on the team, on the basketball team, who got the ball and just wanted to do all the big plays and didn't pass the ball around a lot, and he wanted to showcase his talent and his ability, what did we call him? Yeah, a ball hog. We called him a glory hog. <laughs> you know? He wanted to hog all the glory for himself. He didn't want to give any glory to anybody else because he wanted to make the big play. He wanted to showcase his talents and his ability. And so as I thought about the glory of God, I often would think about uh, glory in, in that framework, that, that why does God want all the glory? That seems rather egotistical to me that anyone would want all the glory, that he would not want to share any glory. And I've heard preachers say that, and, and I think that that's accurate in that God doesn't, God doesn't share his glory, and he is to be exalted through the gifts in our lives and, and everything that God is doing in us that we're to do it to the glory of God. And so this thought of that, that I would be drawn back into just every once in a while, is God a glory freak? Does he just have to have all the glory because he just doesn't, can't stand the thoughts of anybody else having glory? And of course, that's not the reality. Of course, God is a God of love and he's always motivated by love. And so as it comes to the glory, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some definitions of the word glory and how this relates to our lives. You see, the glory of God brings transformation to us. When God is revealed to us, the character, the nature of God, his presence is revealed to us. It always changes us. It always transforms us. And so that's why we have to give God all glory because when we receive glory, it can never lead people into that realm where there is eternal transformation that takes place in their lives. So I've got to turn all glory back to God. I've got to turn all attention back to God because if I leave it on me, there might be benefit to people with the gifts or the skills that I have in my life or the knowledge that I have, but it will only affect the here and now. It will only affect the temporal. And so with the gifts God has given me, I've got to reflect that back to God. And, and I've got to acknowledge it as God working in me because it is when we see the glory of God revealed that we are transformed. In Psalm 3.3, 3, I was trying to decide which scripture to start with. But this one is, is a short one and a simple one. And then I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in just a moment. But in Psalm 3.3 3 it says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. He's our protector. You, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. So the bookends of that verse of scripture are first that he is a shield about us. He is our protector. And then when we are downcast and when we are hurting and when there is crisis and tragedy playing out in our lives, he is the lifter of our head. He lifts our heads up. You know how we hang our head when we're discouraged or when we're depressed. And depression is a very real thing that from time to time most of us struggle with some more than others. And if you struggle with depression at times, he is the shield. He's our protector. It's going to be okay. And he is the lifter of our head in that he lifts us from that sense of hopelessness to understand. But in the middle of that verse, he is my glory. He is my glory. He is the one who has breathed into me. He is the one who has given me life. And when he lifts our heads, he lifts our heads to come face to face with him. That not only is he our glory, but he lifts our, our heads so that we can look full in his face, so that we can truly behold the glory of God. And so the, the definition, a couple of definitions, one from, from the Hebrew from which glory is translated in the Old Testament, and uh, this is far too deep of a subject for me to feel that I really do it justice, but just briefly, it is a demonstration 
of rank, of renown, or beauty. As I cut through the whole thing, that was just the simplest definition I could come to. And, and there's, there's a lot of other nuances, and there's even a lot of other Hebrew words that are translated glory. But in the sense that I'm talking about it and looking at it, think about this, that what is glory? It's a demonstration of rank. When we talk about rank, we talk about comparisons. Um, if, if we are determining rank, then rank means that this person is a little higher than this person because we've ranked it, we've categorized it, and so glory is a demonstration of rank. Glory can be a demonstration of renown, and renown are all of the things that have happened in the past, the history. God is renowned because of his great work. God is renowned. Uh, he, is, he is praiseworthy. He is talked about with great admiration. He is written about in the history books, in the history that's displayed in the Word of God. He is of great renown. And so glory is the demonstration or the recognition of that renown because it is an exaltation. Glory is also a demonstration of beauty. A demonstration of beauty. That's where the guy with the basketball out on the court and he's hogging the basketball. It's, it's just a beautiful thing the way he plays. There is something attractive about it. There is something that exalts those that are attractive to us or those who have skills or attributes or something that we would like to have in our lives, something that we might envy. And it exalts that person, that, that beauty, that thing that is attractive exalts that person. And when we think of the glory of God, this is the revelation of who he is. And we behold his beauty when we look upon his face. It is a revelation of the glory of God. He demonstrates his beauty in our lives. In the New Testament, the word, the Greek word doxa, and again, there's a lot of usages of it, but as I was trying to understand what does the Word of God mean when it uses the word glory, that doxa is an opinion or an estimate. You've heard of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. The doxology. It is words-ology. Doxa-ology. It's words of praise and affirmation is what that would mean, the doxology. So the glory is the expression of an opinion or it is, it, is, it is a high opinion or a high estimate. The glory of God is when we place our confidence in him, knowing that he is able, amen? amen. Knowing that he is able, that brings glory to God because it is our opinion, it is our estimate. And I could even go stronger than that. It is our knowledge. It is our experience of his renown that has been revealed to us that causes us to turn glory to God. You see, the longer we walk with the Lord Jesus and the more Father God and the heart of God is revealed to us and the more we live in the glory of his presence, the more we understand his greatness, his rank, the more we understand the significant impact of his renown, and oh yeah, folks, the more we understand his beauty that goes far beyond any other beauty that we can behold in this life. See, that's our God. And this world is full of people who have not seen the glory of God. They've seen the glory of men. They've seen the mighty acts, even maybe that we've done or or that historical figures have done. But that doesn't bring transformation because it's not a revelation of the glory of God. And so it is our jobs, folks. It is our calling. Every last one of you, it is our calling. It is, it is the reason that we were created. It's to bring glory to God because when we give glory to God and we bring glory to God, then he is revealed to the people that behold the glory of God and they are changed and they are transformed. Then they can see the greatness of God. Then they can give thanks for what God has done. Then they behold his beauty. And that's why this thing of glory 
is so incredibly important. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I hope you enjoy this message because I am. I've never heard it before. <laughs> Saying, Lord, you know, I, I, know what I, I know what you want me to say, but 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to scoot through this just because it's long and I don't want to take all of our time just reading it. But in, in verse 1, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Think about that in the context of chapter 2 where it, where it ends, where the apostle is saying, for we're not in the very last verse of chapter 2, for we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word, but men of sincerity as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak Christ. And then we roll into chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Sometimes we feel like we have to commend ourselves. We have to validate ourselves. And when we do that, we've got to be careful because we don't want to pull any of the glory away from God in order to commend ourselves or to exalt ourselves. And therein we find a very difficult line to walk sometimes and all of us in leadership have had to walk through this in our lives. It is being gifted by God to do certain things and for people to say nice things about you and to commend you for the wonderful works that you've done and especially if you, ha if, if you rank higher than most other people with a particular gift or particular ability or your renown, you've done things that maybe few other people have done or if you're just incredibly beautiful in the sense that people are attracted to you because of your attributes, maybe your character, maybe just who you are. There are some people that are just people magnets and people are just drawn to them because they are attractive in some way, maybe not with physical form, but people are attracted to them. And so as we look at that, listen, you know, we're four steps higher than everybody else here. I would come down there, but I don't feel like juggling my iPad with the microphone. I'd, I'd have a better time if I was down there, but I'll just stay up here and, and stay close to my iPad. But we're, we're up here four steps higher than everybody else. And there's some gifted people on this platform that God has given gifts to them. Um, you know, some phenomenal musicians, some phenomenal voc vocalists. Um, you know, pound for pound, folks, I think, I think there's more gifts and talents, particularly in the musical realm in this church, than, I mean, pound for pound, you could have this going on in a church of 5,000 people right here, and there wouldn't be any feeling of anything lacking. So pound for pound, God's blessed you in that area. Obviously, you have good leadership in that area. So, um, But then when God has gifted us, and folks, here's where we get into what I think that he wants us to really know. When God has gifted us, it's, it can be a real challenge to deflect the glory back to him and, and, and to make sure that we turn the glory back to him. It takes brokenness. It takes humility. It takes anchoring in a keen awareness of where those gifts have come from, who is the author of those gifts, and the purpose of those gifts. See, because if we operate, and I'll stick with that illustration, if we operate out of the gifts that God has given us at the level that we can operate when the glory of God is being revealed through us, it crosses a line from that which is seen into that which is unseen. Now, I'm talking supernatural here, folks, and I'm talking your life. I'm talking your life. If you're the best welder in Marion, Indiana, do it to the glory of God. Because if you will do it to the glory of God, God will be revealed through your welding. And people will be changed by it 
because when you do it for the glory of God, it is an expression of who God is in you. Woo! It is an expression of who God is in you, and it's going to draw people from the realm of what's seen into the realm of the unseen when we do it to the glory of God. And so the apostle says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You ourselves are a letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you're a letter from Christ delivered by us. Now in verse 4 it says, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Listen to verse 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. That's why brokenness is important. That's why yielding to God is so important. Anytime I think that I'm hot stuff, I have to come back to the realization that the gift that is operating in me is not to be despised, but it is to be directed to God and I am to do it to the glory of God so that it can be eternally transformational in the lives of people. Not that we're sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter of but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And then he talks about the ministry of death. He talks about the law that was given on Mount Sinai as that was the first covenant, or that was the old covenant. And that law was given, and the glory of the Lord radiated on Moses' face because he was in the presence of God. And the reason that we long for and we desire the presence of God is because the glory of God is revealed in the presence of God. And when the glory of God is revealed, we change. We are transformed into his likeness. It is set before us as a pattern and it changes something in us. The glory of God revealed in our in our. In our lives. And in Moses' face, the glory was so strong and so powerful in his face that he covered his face with a veil. And I'll get back to that, but in verse 9 it's saying, If there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, which was the law that was given, the law condemns, but Jesus Christ sets us free. The old covenant condemns us and points out our faults, but the new covenant sets us free and redeems us in Christ Jesus and delivers us from our faults. Bless God. That's the gospel. And if the old covenant had glory, how much more the new covenant? It says in verse 11, For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent. And so it says in verse 12, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. There is boldness when we walk in the glory of God. There is boldness when we operate in the gifts that God has given us. There is boldness when we walk in obedience to God. You know why? I'm not. In one way I am, but in another way I'm not responsible (laughs) for the outcomes here. This is God's gift, it's God's calling. And I'm not responsible for the outcomes. Bro, I'm never going to be able to preach this again the same way ever. I'm already thinking, how am I going to preach this exactly the same? It won't be exactly the same, but we'll give it another shot in a second. I'm feeling, you know. It's God. It's His gift. Now, what about, what about when we take the attitude that... We have no responsibility in it and we have no need to prepare or we have no need to grow or we have no need to press into the gifts or the calling or the abilities God's given us. Well, that would be wrong because the Word tells us to do everything to the glory of God. There was a violin player 
who, and this is a true story, but he was in a music conservatory of a university, and he was was with the the symphony, and and they were they were being instructed by the master, and so he was to play a piece. I think it was a piece. Um, I think it might have been a piece by Mozart or Bach. I'll just I'll just say Bach for the for the sake of it. I have to go back and look at it again to remember which of those composers. But he was, he was, he was I'll, I'll say Mozart. That has a better feel. It's a, I don't know which composer it was, but I'm going to say it for the sake of it. But he is, he's playing the piece, and he plays it beautifully. He executes the piece beautifully. And the instructor just looks at him, and he says, You know, with your ability and with your skill, you could get a job with most any symphony orchestra in most any major city. And they'd pay you well enough that you could buy a little house with a little white fence in front of it. And you could find a nice girl and you could get married. And you could have 2.5 children. And you could live a good life. But Mozart didn't write that song so that you could get a job with the symphony orchestra and buy a little house with a white picket fence, find a nice lady, marry her, have 2.5 children, and live a good life. Mozart wrote that song for the glory of God, and you need to play it like it's to the glory of God. You see, there's something down inside us. There is the presence of God that's down inside us. When we are Christ followers and we've been transformed by Him, there is something inside us. A musician can often tell you better than anyone else can simply because it's very clear to them at times that you can either play out of your mind or you can play out of your soul, and that's why they call it soul music, you know. It's because it's coming from the soul. It's coming from inside. It's something you feel. It's not something you think. It's something you feel. But friends, as followers of Jesus, it goes one step further. We don't just play out of our mind. We don't just play out of our soul. We play out of the Spirit. And there's something that will rise up within us that transcends who we are. And it's like when I preach and words come out of my mouth that I never thought of before. It's the demonstration of the glory of God. And when you're playing an instrument, stuff starts coming out of it that you never heard before. It's because you're playing to the glory of God. And there is something in the spirit that just rises up within And when you stand there and you weld with both hands and you get it perfect and you break it off and you say, there you go, you know that there's something in it that transcends your own ability. Folks, this is God's work in our lives. And this is why the scriptures say not many of you were noble. Not many of you were wealthy. Not many of you had much to offer. But you gave it to God. And he uses that which is ennoble. He uses that which is poor and poverty stricken. He uses that that he can do a work in. And so, folks, as we consider the glory of God, we've got to consider the work that God is doing in us, that we do everything that we do to the glory of God. And so Moses comes down off of this mountain in verse 12, says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Since the Spirit of Jesus Christ lives in us, we are very bold. And since our gifts come from Him, and he has developed them, and he has worked in us, and he's moved in us, we will be very bold because our confidence is not a confidence in the flesh. Our confidence is in the Spirit of God that dwells in us. Our confidence is in the presence of God that we carry with us because his glory is revealed in our lives. You want to talk about glory? We are dirt with the breath of God breathed into us. We are nothing, we have nothing that did not originate with our maker that is on loan from God. In fact, it's not on loan, it still belongs to him. And so, whatever it is, that's where I want to go. Do I always operate like that? No. Do you always operate like that? No. But when we submit to the presence of God in our lives, 
He begins to lead us places that we didn't think about. He starts to do things in us that we never thought about. And so since we have a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. What happened? The glory of God was so strong that it made Moses' face glow. But what did he do? He put a veil over it so that they couldn't see the full impact of the glory of God. And he's saying, in this day and age when Jesus Christ lives in us, dwells in us, he brings the presence of God to us. That we are to be bold not to cover the glory of God, not to cover what God is doing. But why did Moses cover his face? It's because their minds were hardened. It's because they couldn't receive the revelation of the glory of God because of a hardness that was in their hearts. It had to be covered. You see, we cannot behold the glory of God unless we dwell in His presence. We can't behold the glory of God if we're hardened in our hearts. It takes being crucified to self, surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ so that He is our all in all. It takes breaking down the barriers of sin, the barriers of shame, and of all of the negative effects of it, of the old covenant and stepping into the new covenant so that the glory of God can be revealed to us. It says, for to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. Why? Because they didn't get it. They didn't understand. Because it is only through Christ that it's taken away. And so we see all those years ago in the Old Testament, when we see Moses with the veil covering his face so that they, they, they were incapable because it's in Christ that that veil is taken away, that we're able to behold fully the work of God. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Wow. As I consider this glory, God has shown our lives. We sing a song, Show Me Your Glory. Saying, God, show me your rank. Show me your superiority over all others. Show me your renown, what you've done and what you can do in me and in this world. Show me your beauty that I may be drawn to it deeper into your presence, that I may deeply yearn for it, that I may experience a revelation in your glory like none that I've ever known. There was a revival 20 years ago in Pensacola, Florida. I decided to go. And I was desperate for the presence of God in my life. I went to the revival and encountered God in a mighty way. But I went back to the hotel room. And I laid in bed and I just, I sought, I sought the presence of God and I opened myself up to the presence of God. Somewhere in that night, the presence of God began to fill the room in that hotel room. And it was, it was like a weight that began to settle down upon me. And I'd experienced that before, and I got afraid. It was years before when I was pastoring a church. I was in prayer one morning in the sanctuary of that church, and I felt the glory of God begin descending in a very tangible and a very heavy way. And it scared me because I thought I was going to die. And so I said, God, I can't take this. And that glory lifted. Some years later, being in that hotel room, I sensed the glory of God beginning to settle down in a powerful way. And I began to grow a little bit frightened because there is this feeling like you're not going to survive this. And I hope you all don't think I'm crazy. I really don't think I am. 
I'm one of the most stable people I know. <laughs> and I almost opened my mouth to say, God, I can't take this. And I remembered before, and I remember the disappointment that I felt when that lifted. And I remembered promising myself, if I ever feel that again, if it kills me, I'm going to experience it. And that night, the glory of God settled down. And as I lay in the darkness on that bed, I was, folks, I was afraid to open my eyes because I didn't know what I would see. Finally, I opened my eyes and I saw a dark room. But when my eyes were closed in my spirit, there was a lot of stuff going on. It was the revelation of the glory of God. And something happened in me that night, 20 years ago. It changed my prayer life. It changed my walk for seven months because I took note of it. For seven months, there was not a thought that entered my brain that I had to battle with in any way, shape, or form. I've never walked through a period of time like that in my entire life. But for seven months, there was never any thought that ever entered my mind that I had to do battle with. Every night when I would go to bed, I would go to bed hearing the voice of God. And every morning when I would wake up, I would hear songs in my head for seven months. And it was an incredible time. I've only encountered stuff like that a time or two in my life. But I want to encourage you today that the glory of God is not just about the settling down of this weighty presence. When I hear people preach the word of God, and preach about the glory of God. I hear people who are preaching about an outpouring or a revival or how sometimes we just sense the glory of God being outpoured in our midst. And I love those times. You all know what I'm talking about? There's transformation that comes into our lives, permanent transformation during those times because the glory of God, His character, His nature, His presence is revealed to us so that we can lay eyes on it in the realm of the Spirit, and it changes us. But as I walk in this day by day, I have discovered that the glory of God does not needfully come through a very emotionally charged time in an altar. Because I've learned that I can sit with a cup of coffee in a recliner in my study And the glory of God can fill that room. I've learned that if I yield and I walk with Him, that as I walk with Him day by day, that the glory of God can fill my life. And that He can be revealed in every action of the day. I've already said it, just look in the mirror. You are a reflection of the glory of God just because you're alive and you're created. The glory of God can be revealed to us according to the way that God made us. And I just strongly felt that I wanted to encourage you that you don't have to dance and you don't have to shout and run. You might. To experience the glory of God, He reveals Himself in our lives every day because Jesus Christ is resident in us. Moving from glory to glory, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, there is one revelation built upon another. It's an increasing awareness of the superiority and the rank of God. It's an increasing awareness of who He is and His acts of renown. It's an increasing attraction to God, a deepening of love which deepens dedication because our interests are dedicated. It is an attractiveness to God that stirs a passion within us that causes us to go forth in the glory of God. And so folks, what I believe that God sent me here to tell you today is behold His glory. Behold His glory in the working of your life because Jesus has made a new and a better covenant through which the glory of God can be revealed to you. If you are a hairstylist, do it to the glory of God. And if you do it to the glory of God, God is going to open up doors and opportunities for you because His glory is going to transform people's lives through that. If you're a carpenter or a contractor, 
Do it to the glory of God, that the reflection of the image of God is seen in it. If you're an artist, it's got to flow not only from your mind, not only from your soul, but it comes out of your spirit and it is an expression. We can live an average life. We can acquire skills and we can live an average life. But I tell you, God has called us to live a supernatural life. And he is revealed in you through the glory of God that is at work in your life. And so as we press into the presence of God to reveal his glory, which I don't know what that looks like for you, and I don't know what God wants to do in your life individually, because I have learned that the expression of the glory of God is as buried as there are people in this place. But God will flow through you through his glory so that those who have not seen him, they will see him in you and they will be changed and they will be transformed. And this is the work that God wants to do in you. And so here's what you've got to do. You've got to do what you do as to the glory of God. But first, we've got to walk in his presence. We've got to meet with him. Listen, I want to be an encourager to the body of Christ I'm going to get into this and I'm going to get back out of it real fast. When I was a young pastor, I I had a prayer routine. And it was good because I, I needed that. But you've got to engage with God according to the way he made you and wired you, okay? And if someone's telling you that you're not really engaging with God unless you do it exactly this way, that's not right. What you've got to do is get in the presence of God. I've been through several seasons of my prayer life. Right now, I get a cup of coffee and I set it by my chair and I'll open my iPad and I'm ready to type because he's going to start talking. And I'm ready. And I can, feel, I can feel his glory begin to rise up. I can, C.S. Lewis once said, I never wrote a book. I just took dictation. That's the way I feel when I write, see, because it's God speaking to me. I listen. And sometimes I say things back. A lot of times I do, but I listen. Acclimate yourself to set in the presence of God. His glory will be revealed in your life and transformation will come to people that you encounter. Amen. Church, I want you to think about what you do. What is it that God's put in your life? And some of you are saying, God's put nothing in my life. He breathed in the dirt and made you. I know people who have impacted thousands because they just invited people into their kitchen and made cinnamon rolls. And that was passed on to their kids. And just taking the time to be obedient to God and to use the gift that God's given you to show forth glory to God because I'm telling you, I've said it five times, I'm going to say it one more time. Because when you do it to the glory of God, the glory of God is revealed and people are transformed. You can make a difference, folks. You can make a difference if you'll operate in the glory of God. Not the glory of you, but the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for your people, that you would strengthen them and that you'd lift them up today. God, we are seekers of your presence. Lord, we desire to see you revealed in our lives. We desire to be transformed and changed, Lord. We desire to be moved to another place with you, Lord, so that we can see you more clearly. But, oh God, you, you reveal yourself to us in every situation of our lives. God, I pray that you'd begin to speak to people right now and make practical application. Begin to show them the opportunities that are before them, not 10 years from now, not five years from now, but today and tomorrow. The opportunities that are set before them to reflect the glory of God. Lord, that we pull not from our intellect, not even from our soul or our flesh, but Lord, in all that we do, that we pull from the Spirit of God so that you might be glorified. 
Lord, we want to see you. We want to know you. We want to experience you in church. We want to experience you in our prayer closet. We want to experience you when we lay upon our beds at night. We want to experience you at our jobs, at our school. We want to experience you. God, we open up ourselves to receive your presence and to be filled by you. Folks, two weeks ago, I was at my father-in-law's church and we preached there. And I, I sat there on the front row and the Spirit of God was talking to me about how he wanted the service to end and that he wanted to do certain things. See, when God called me into the ministry when I was 17 years old, I could see myself on a platform speaking to thousands of people. And that's kind of sort of happened, but not every week, you know. It's because I wanted to be exalted. Pastor, I wanted to be exalted. I wanted people to to say, wow, that guy really knows God. Not because God would be exalted, but when I finally got honest with myself, it was so I would be exalted. I've started a lot of things in my life that I had to quit because all of a sudden a thought would come to my mind and I'd think, wow, people are going to think that I'm awesome. And as soon as those words would come out of my mouth, I would just close the book slide it away say God I'm not ready yet I'm not ready yet this is for your glory and if it's anything else I'm not going to do it because I can write the greatest book that's ever been written I can preach the best sermon that's ever been preached I can cut the best weld that's ever been made but if it's David instead of Jesus there won't be eternal transformation folks That's what this is about. Maybe you need an attitude adjustment today. Maybe you need to surrender something to God. But two weeks ago, I sat on the front row of that church, and the Holy Spirit said to me, David, you know that ministry you wanted when you were young? The ministry where you lay hands on people and awesome things happen and all of that. Yeah, I remember. I've not even told my wife this. Two weeks ago, the Holy Spirit said to me, it's yours if you want it. You know what I said? I said, that's okay. I want to do what you want. I think it was a test. If that's what you really want, no, I just want to see people's lives transformed however you want to do it in me, however you want to do it through me. Folks, God wants to do a work in you. Let's just bow our heads before the Lord because this passage says that we can't see the glory of God unless it's been revealed by Jesus Christ. We can't really know the character and the nature of God. Folks, why do I believe in God? It's not because of one single theological argument. Why do I believe in God? It's because I know him. If the wicked people came and took all the Bibles away tomorrow, I'd still believe in God and he would still reveal himself to me. That's why I believe in God. Because I know him. But you can't know him unless you accept Jesus. You might say this whole thing doesn't make sense to me. But I'm telling you, if you know Jesus, the veil is removed and you behold the glory of God and every day it gets stronger and stronger from that moment forward you move from glory to glory revelation to revelation knowledge to knowledge And so first I want to say if you need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today to know him so that the veil is removed and you can know God and you can know his glory then I want to encourage you today to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. Folks, could we just stand together as we change positions because I want you to be postured to begin to worship God. If you need prayer today or you need to make a commitment to the Lord, 
I want to encourage you to come to this altar. We'll lay hands upon you. We'll believe with you for the presence of God. Maybe you need a revelation of God, a fresh revelation of God. Maybe you need the veil removed a little further. Or perhaps you just want to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. But if you need prayer this morning, you desire prayer. Or perhaps he's calling you to commit your gifts and your talents to him once again so that they could be lent, given, so that the glory of God could be revealed. Paul, just lead us in worship in the presence of God. And as God prompts you, we'll take time to pray with you as God prompts you.